Um, my name is Aoife. I'm not actually an anesthetist, I'm a medic who does intensive care, so I'm the new brand of intensive care training. Um, so I'm not an emergency medic, is the first thing, but I will say that I did choose my first registrar job based on two things. The first was I really like the ITU at Coventry, and the second thing is that I really, really like the AD department, so AD is a very important part of my day to day life. So, um, when Scott asked me to do a talk called How to Be an Awesome Learner, the first thing I thought was, I literally have no business telling anybody how to do that. I'm not very good at it myself. But the second thing I thought was, Irish people don't call themselves awesome. You definitely don't go around calling yourselves awesome. So I've had to change the title to something that is more fitting to somebody who was born and bred in Dublin. So the closest word that we have to awesome in Dublin is bleeding deadly. And it's important that you drop the G and make it bleeding because that's what makes it real. Um, now I get that that's um, a less than appropriate set of adjectives to use for a talk of medical education, but I can say it without getting sick in my mouth, so I'm going to stick with it. Um, the second thing to say is, I think that healthcare professionals already know how to learn. I still remember that question in medical school I interviewed, tell us about your learning style. And I remember I didn't really have an answer for it then, and I don't really have an answer for it now. I went to school for 14 years and I went to university for 8 years. But I think you may as well ask me how I read. I just read. So I think that this talk probably isn't really about how to be an awesome learner. It's probably more about just how to cope when you're trying to learn and not to go crazy when you're a trainee. And somebody read this talk and said, why don't you just call it to be? And I said, well, that sounds really arrogant. So we're going to stick with that one. Um, one of the most important questions I think that we need to think about is whether or not learning in emergency situations is really any different than learning in, in situations generally. And I think it is. I think it feels different. It's probably something like reading a book on an armchair at home by yourself versus reading a book a foot away from the edge of a cliff with a gun to your head. You're still just reading, but you're going to feel pretty different about it. I think that learning in emergency situations is a bit like being in an arena. You've got basically this challenge, you've got other competitors hanging around resource, you've got this person at the top who gets to say whether or not you're doing a pleasing job, and then you've got this audience that comes and goes and gets to judge you as well. Now there are some pros about being in an arena, and it's, it's where I've got this imagery from obviously, and it's a prose that means a lot to me, and I'm not going to read it because Bit embarrassing but I have put it on those cards um, which are on the table the yellow cards um, but the point of this prose is that basically it says that if you want to be in the, in the arena you have to accept that you're going to be exposed to error and shortcoming and failure there's going to be a lot of stress but it, it's not an optional thing it's just it's going to be there now I'm sure you've probably all heard of the Eric's Dodson law which is basically a curve that tells us that actually stress can be a good thing so um, when we look at physiological and mental arousal, you get an increase in performance up to a point. But if you tip over the top of the summit, it's very steep to fall down. Now, the thing about medical, it's a very steep fall down. So if you're standing in the emergency department, you're doing something, and this has happened to me on more than one occasion, you might be doing it badly, you might be thinking you can't let a patient. If you're not doing it right in that moment, then somebody might just tell you to get out of the way. And that's very difficult to deal with as a training. But the truth is that you're not the most, you're not the most important person in the room. Just fine, we're all grown ups, we know that the patient comes first. So that isn't the most difficult thing about learning in emergency situations. The most difficult thing is actually that not everybody in those situations will act fairly. Not everybody's going to judge you fairly. And not everybody's going to be right about you. And some people will be, but they all get the same access. And you can't control it. Now, if you ask me, that is literally the most difficult thing to deal with as a trainee in an emergency situation. The thing about being a trainee, or any kind of medical professional, is that there's this kind of preconditioning. It's literally in this Declaration of Geneva that I stood up and read at graduation. I will give my teachers the respect that is their due. Being a teacher in a situation of medicine comes with this power, this kind of authority. 
And you get this power, whether you earned it or not, and whether you realize it or not. Now, if anybody ever asked me, maybe three, four months ago, if I thought anybody ever felt that way about me, like felt intimidated by virtue of my authority, I would have said, no, of course not. And I probably would have laughed at them. But that's until about two and a half, three months ago. I literally made a medical student pre-signable. So I was, um, it sounds dramatic, but it's actually true. So I was up on the wards, and I was IT reg on call, and I'd seen this man with head injury. And um, he also had alcohol withdrawal. So I brought him down, and he had a reduced GCS. Now, the way the medical school curriculum works at our medical school now means that we get these students randomly for single days. We never know them. They just arrive, and then they leave again. And this medical student was hanging around and she kind of looked like she wanted to do something. So I was admitting the patient and multitasking and I just started to ask her about the patient's GCS. And she didn't know the patient's GCS, so I started to ask her just really simple questions so that she felt like maybe she could answer something. And to me, this was like a perfectly casual, non-confrontational, off-the-cuff encounter, but I really wouldn't give her a second thought to at all. Until I looked at her and she just, the colour drained from her face. I had to grab her a chair and sit her down. And that, clearly I just pushed her right over the top of this curve and I wasn't even trying. <laughs> <laughs> and all I could think was that, I'm standing there thinking, who gave me that authority? When did I get that authority? Well, that's the thing. You get the authority whether you earned it or not and whether you realise it or not. The other thing about training is that being a trainee in medicine today feels a bit like being in school forever. Not in the whole kind of, the whole world, the whole world is a classroom, philosophical, happy sense. In the literal sense, you walk around and you're called junior doctors, doctors in training. And you spend a lot of time asking people to externally validate your learning, and actually to externally validate you. And I think the risk with training today is that all this process of moving and external validation doesn't create strong, confident professionals. Kind of creates the equivalent of a dysfunctional child who move ten times during their school their school years. Um, now, I do have some issues with kind of the text box ARCP curriculum that we have today. But my main point is that the factors that control training from an external point of view, in my opinion, they tend to infantilize trainees. They have a system that breeds insecurity. And genuinely, it is very easy to forget, even as a registrar, that you're a grown-up professional at all. So, I wondered what it was that we're actually looking for when we're bouncing around hospital to hospital, trying to kind of have positive learning experiences. And I had this hypothesis, and I called it the Dumbledore hypothesis, because I'm a massive Harry Potter geek, but also because I genuinely think he embodies basically what everybody wants in a teacher. So I asked 167 people um, via Twitter um, who were doctors to choose for me their favorite teacher or their ideal teacher referencing popular culture. And you can guess who came out on top. It was Dumbledore. Now, there was variance. Um, and the second was um, this guy, which is um, John Keating. It's played by Ronnie Corbin Williams. Um, but the general theme of this wise, older, unfortunately, man um, did prevail throughout the answers. Like somebody even chose Santa Claus. Um, two of the other most popular choices was Atticus Finch and Sir David Attenborough. Um, but here's the thing. None of us are actually, well, some of us are great teachers. I'm not, but some of us are great teachers. Um, but none of us are, you know, wizards or heroes. We're just everyday people who have good days and bad days. And even with the best will in the world, when you're in an emergency situation, the priority is the patient in front of you first and teaching second. And yet we all have this power, this authority or something that's really important, somebody else's learning, we all have this power to help somebody learn and we want to help them keel over. So, I think sometimes, I mean I'm not trying to be very depressing, sometimes you will meet people and they genuinely will be a version of Dumbledore or Miss Honey. But sometimes people are really just more mistrunchable. And then there's this other type of people who John Hines best described as racist wankers who literally will come into your life and they, they will have nothing good to give you. And there's this fourth type of people who will seem like the most loathsome, 
unapproachable people you will ever meet, but actually turn out to be your biggest allies. So people are complicated. But if you want to succeed in learning within emergency situations, and this is what you have to put up with. It brings me to a word that I don't like, which is resilience. And the reason I don't like this word is it's become this hollow and vapid term that's used to blame trainees for problems that are inherent to a system. But it is important because, like I said, I'm not an expert in medical education. And it took me a surprisingly long time to realize this. But when I'm not learning in my job, it is genuinely as simple as I just feel like I'm surrounded by more people that don't embody what I want in an ideal teacher and less, that, and less by those that do. So I asked the same 167 people what it was about those ideal teachers that made them ideal. What is it they're actually looking for? And again, those variants in the answers. But the general themes stood out quite strongly, and it was nothing surprising. So what we're looking for is knowledge, patience, enthusiasm, clarity, encouragement, kindness, and wisdom. So what is the answer? How do you get all of these things in your life when you can't even control who your teachers are or where you even go in the first place? And I think the answer is this. I think firstly, you have to stop expecting anybody to be all of these things. You have to stop expecting anybody to be any of these things. And the second thing is that you have to take responsibility for filling in the gaps yourself. Now, that Taking responsibility for something that isn't your fault is a bit difficult because as a trainee, it feels like you're saying, it's okay that teacher A is really a patient and teacher B never encourages me. But accepting responsibility for making something better for yourself really has nothing to do with improving their behavior. You're just doing what you can do to make things better. Now, this is a bit of an abstract concept, so I tried to think of an example that would work in real life. Um, and the best one that I came up with was this. So, um, I do love where I work, I absolutely love working in commentary, um, but not everybody is who you want them to be all the time. So um, one day, it was just after Christmas, I was in Resus and myself and the AE registrar had taken a patient with asthma. And we'd been called, she'd been phoned as a medical alert, and she was really sick. Paramedics had said that they thought she had a respiratory arrest and the ambulance had bagged her for a bit. She came in kind of early 40s, and she was very sick. She had like an almost silent chest, not like completely <coughs> silent. Her CO2 was nearly nine. And you know, she, she was really struggling. So I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, she's really sick, I might have to tube this, this woman. And you know, if you ask me, everybody knows it, you know, you know the indications for an intubation, but I'm looking at this woman and for some reason, I, I, I can't make the decision to tube her. And I'm thinking that, like, okay, she's nearly silent, her CO2 is almost nine. Like, in an OSCE, you would tube her, and in a Viva, I would tube her, and in any kind of sim session, I would definitely tube her, but something is stopping me from making the decision. So I'm standing there, and I'm just thinking, oh God, yes, no, what do I do? So I went to the AD consultant, and I kind of, I didn't say I can't make this decision, but I made it clear I couldn't make the decision. So he wandered in with me, and we came up with a plan, which was basically that we would give it 15 minutes, and if she got better, like clearly better, we wouldn't tube her, but if she stayed the same or got worse, we would tube her. And she got better, which was great. Now, this was a pretty big event for me, not because she got better, not because the clinical outcome was good, because I don't think I could remember a time in the recent past where I literally couldn't make a decision, and I needed to talk about it, I guess. So my own consultant, he had um, known that I was in research with a patient, and he wandered along sometime later. The patient was much better by then. So I gave him a brief history. I told him about it, and I showed him the gases, and I gave him more clinical detail than I'd given you. And he looked at me and he said, she wasn't sick. And I was like, what? And he's like, no, she wasn't that sick. And I was like, you see, the gas for CO2 was nine. I told you she was sick. And he just looked at me and he laughed and he left. And I'm standing there and just thinking, hmm, right, okay. And I was mad and I was upset. But I was mostly mad and I was thinking, God, why is he being such a trap? And you think, right, in that situation what you have to do is think, right, what did I need from that person? Well, I needed him to discuss it. I needed to test my decision making skills, so I needed to know if that was a good decision or if I just got lucky. 
I need them to be encouraging, to be patient, to be kind, to listen to me, um, to have the wisdom to know that I needed to do the grief on this. But actually what I got was nothing, just like a laugh and he walked away. And I think in that situation you've got two options. The first one is that you can say, that teacher's really rubbish, I wish she, wish she wasn't the consultant that was on for IT today, and leave it at that. But the second thing you can do is recognize what you needed from him, all of the soft things like patience and kindness and encouragement, and just do them for yourself. You can be that encouraging and kind person to yourself. And once you've done that, and then once you separate yourself from his reaction, you can then go and find somebody else to debrief on the clinical stuff with. It doesn't have to be the same person. And I think the point is that you don't get to go away from what you need to learn because the clinical teaching that was put in front of you wasn't good enough. It's your responsibility to find somebody else. Um, now, I know what people are going to say, that you can walk around being double or what you like, but if all your teachers are not very good, then you're never going to get anywhere. And I see your point. But I still think that if you're only interested in looking for solutions to problems that involve other people changing, then you're really never going to get anywhere very fast. And I think the beautiful thing about being in medicine is that we don't learn in a classroom. This isn't classroom education. None of us in medicine are just teachers and just students. So our learning doesn't look like this. And maybe, I guess, about 10 years ago before I was a doctor, it looked like this. But genuinely, what learning in medicine looks like, or should look like now, it looks more like this. And this really is the most beautiful and powerful thing because I guess what I'm really saying is there's a lot that you can't control about where you go or what teachers you get given. You can control what you give yourself. And if you can become the sort of person who genuinely can take responsibility for bringing <coughs> the things that you want in your life, into your own life, then you will be that thing for other people because that's how our system is set up. And, you know, medicine today, it isn't a school, it's more like a society. And at the risk of sounding corny, you literally do have to be the change that you want to see. Um, change, any change, it's about a critical mass. You do have to start with yourself and you do have to take responsibility for that. So genuinely, I do think that if you want to be unstoppable with the medicine, you have to take responsibility and be your own Dumbledore.